All right, we're going to uh, pick up with chapter five today. Uh, and I managed in 18 slides to get all the way through verse six. So we didn't get real far with the slides. So we're going to do half a chapter today. We'll do the other half maybe next week and we'll go from there. But first, let's, let's open with the word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for this evening. I thank you that we are able to be together in your house and we are able to study your word. Lord, as, as we open the pages of our Bibles, as we study this most difficult book, I pray that you will grant us wisdom and insight, and that, Lord, you will draw us closer to you and closer together as we study your word. Father, I pray that these will not just be empty words for us, but that we will take your words and hide them in our heart, that we may not sin against you. And I pray, Father, that we will hear the good news, we will be encouraged, and we will be able to share with others as well. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so we are not going to go back and review too much, but I do want to just go and jump back. Again, I always talk about context being important, and you've heard me say in the past, and I'll say it again in the future, the words of God are divinely inspired. The chapters and verses, or the <laughs> numbers, are not, okay? So those are arbitrarily kind of, I don't say arbitrarily, but they were put in there about 1300, I believe, so a lot later so that people could help talk and study, or not 1300, maybe, anyway. It was a long time after the Bible was written and compiled, as it is today, that they added verses and uh, chapters. So we're not going to really follow those. We're going to follow the flow of the words as we move through. But looking back at chapter 4, John is transported to heaven, right? He first, the first visions, chapters 1 through 3, he was on Patmos, and he was writing to the earthly churches. Chapter 4... And chapter 5 as well serve as kind of a transition from the first part of the vision to the second half, chapter 6 through 20. Right Now John is in heaven as opposed to earth. And so he sees this throne and he sees uh, God in the center and he sees the angels and the four elders or the four beasts and the elders, the 24 elders there represent the Old Testament and the New Testament coming together united as one. <clears throat> and... Uh, they're proclaiming forever and ever and ever. You are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they are created. All right, so John is looking in heaven. He's looking at the throne room, and he sees God seated on the throne. Okay, that's, that's where we're going to kind of pick up. That's the scene that's been set. The angels are flying around. People were, uh, the, the elders are bowed down to worship. That's what's going on. Okay, that's where we are. <clears throat> so, let's jump right into chapter 5. I'm going to read down through um, verse 5, and then we'll, we'll continue from there. <coughs> Again, I'm reading from the NIV, so if you have a different translation, I'm not saying one's better or worse than the other, unless it's the message, and then, ugh, but um, we'll talk about that later if you have questions. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, and, seated with seven, and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. All right. We'll stop right there for just a minute. <clears throat> and uh, just as, as a point of reference, on your, your handout sheets, I tried to use larger font this time because some of you complained about the words being too small. I don't know if it made a difference on your handouts or not, but I tried. So <clears throat> uh, where you see scripture references, there's a lot of scripture I'm going to read tonight, or at least reference. I didn't have room to put everything on the slides, but at least you have the reference so you can go and look it up later. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So let's talk about this scroll, right? John's looking at the throne room. He sees God seated on the throne. Well, he kind of sees God. He says, I see a figure seated on the throne. I see someone seated on the throne, and there's this holy aura, like this, this rainbow of color surrounding him in this heavenly glow. And he says, then in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, I saw a scroll with writing on both sides. So let's talk about this scroll that is sealed with seven seals. Okay. Um, now, a scroll was the primary form of literature at the time. Books 
as we know them were not invented until much later. Uh, that was, um, in, in the Greek, that's called a codex. In the, in the Revelation here, it's called a biblio, right? It's, it's a book, but it's a scroll made of parchment. Now, this scroll is, is not a new idea for them, or seeing God with a scroll. In Isaiah 29, verse 11, God is speaking of prophecy. He said, for you, this whole vision is nothing but words sealed in a scroll. And I apologize for my, my typing here. And if you give the scroll to someone who can read and say to him, read this, please, he will answer, I can't. It is sealed. Right? So God's saying to Isaiah, you, you, here it is, right? People can't see it. It's, 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 it's prophecy, but it's all sealed up. And you can try to give it to someone who can read, and they can't read it. Why? Because it's sealed up. And so John, again, is seeing this. And remember, Isaiah was written thousands of years before John was written, or the Revelation. And yet here we see this consistency. And then in Daniel, chapter 12, verse 9, Daniel says, when all, is all this going to take place? When's all this going to happen? And God says, when the power of the holy people is finally broken, then all these things will come to place. Then he says, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the end of time. Right? He says to Daniel, hey, Daniel, I get that you have questions, but just go do your thing. This is something that is sealed beyond your control, beyond your understanding until the end of time. <clears throat> and now here we are at the end of time, right? John is looking forward in, into time, and he sees God seated there with a sealed scroll. Well, again, there is continuity through Scripture, Genesis to Revelation. As I heard one pastor say, everything from index to max, everything in between that is important. And so we see the same continuity, past, present, future. God is still the same. God's plan doesn't change. We see sealed scrolls, Old Testament. Now we see this sealed scroll in the hand of God. <clears throat> and it's a scroll with seven seals. So what is this thing? Well, if we read ahead a little bit, we're going to see that this scroll is God's plan for man's destiny. As we see the scrolls or the seals being broken and the results of that, it directly impacts the future of humanity. What's going to happen? And so that's what this is. It's, it's an important scroll. It's not just a, you know, here, take this and read this note. This is important. It deals with our fate, if you will, for the rest of time. So why is it a secret, right? Why is it sealed seven times? Well, the ways of God are not known to man. I don't understand why God does the things that God does sometimes. I, I wish I had a little more understanding, but then again, if I did, I probably wish I didn't. You guys know what I mean? I wish he would give me the Noah treatment. Hey, Noah, buddy, everybody's wicked but you, okay? I'm going to kill everyone off in the whole world and all everything that breathes except for you and your family I need you to build me a boat. I need it this big, this deep, this wide, this good, this pitch, this many compartments. I need to have this many levels. And this day, I'm going to make it start raining, okay? So you got to have everything done. Noah got the whole plan. A lot of times, we get the Abraham plan. Hey, Abraham. Yeah, what? Leave. <clears throat> Why? Because I said so. Okay. That's what we get. We just get the first step. I, I don't understand the ways of God. And, and this is nothing that's new for us. In, in Psalm 139, 16, uh, and you see 16b in, in your A's and B's, it means we're taking part of that verse. We're not going to read the whole section. So when I say 18 or 16b, I'm picking up in the second half of the verse. All right, so this is, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. So why is this sealed beyond our understanding? Because it's God's plans. <laughs> I don't always understand God's plans. And I think that's why he's kept them for him. They're his plans. And at the right time, they will be revealed to us, but not before. You know, I, I wouldn't ask Clara to go out and try to push start a car. Why? Because she's not strong enough to be able to do that. I wouldn't ask her to carry a bag full of weights. Why? Because she's not ready for that. She's not prepared to carry that something that's that heavy. A lot of times we want information from God and God says, you're just not ready for that yet. You're not ready to handle that kind of weight yet. So trust me and when the time is right, you'll get it. <clears throat> and we see that it's in the right hand of God. This is important. 
Now, for us, we offer the right hand of fellowship. Why? Because it's what we always do and everybody's right-handed, right? No. We offer the right hand of fellowship because of the culture that has come from the Jewish people. You had a clean hand and you had a dirty hand, right? Because you had to remain ceremonially clean throughout the day and you would do things that were ceremonially unclean, like, you know, relieve yourself. Well, if I have to constantly run and I'm constantly ceremonially unclean, I can't ever get anything done. If all I'm doing all day is purifying myself ritually so that I can go and do the next thing. There's a good hand and a bad hand, a hand of blessing and a hand of cursing, right? <coughs> the right hand was the hand of fellowship. The left hand was the hand that you used to clean yourself, so it was ceremonially unclean. There's a reason we don't offer the left hand of fellowship, because this was always considered the lesser hand, unclean. It was the working hand. This was the good hand. And you think about it, even today, with this hand, I, I can write the world's most beautiful poetry. I can write songs. I can declare revolutions. I can, this hand, I can't hold a pencil right. <laughs> I can't spell my name without it looking like a four-year-old did it, right? <sighs> this is the good hand. This hand, eh, it's here. <laughs> it's functional. I can do some things with it, but it's not nearly as good as this one. The scroll is in the right hand of God. This is the hand of blessing, the hand of omnipotence, the hand of authority, the hand of provision, the hand of strength, the hand of deliverance. If you go back and read all the scriptures, and there are a lot of scriptures that talk about the hand of God, it always mentions the right hand. Your right hand upholds me. Your right hand blesses me. Your right hand pours out this. Your right hand, this is the hand that does all those things. And so for the scroll to be in the right hand of God means that it's important. It's not, again, just a set of cliff notes, hey, Jesus, here, read this. It's, this is from the hand of God himself. This is the most important document that we've seen up to this point. To be at the right hand of God is a place of honor and a place of authority. If you're at the right hand of the Father, the right hand of God, that's the seat of blessing. That's where you want to be. When, you, when they were sitting at a table, right, they all wanted to be at the right hand of Jesus. Why? Because we naturally tend to favor our right. And so if you're going to talk to someone confidentially and have a conversation, if you're at the right hand, you have his ear. All right? you, you have that seat of importance. And so for this to be in the right hand of God is significant. Let's not just glaze over that. So that begs the question, if it's in his right hand, well, who's, who's at the right hand now? Here's your Sunday school answer. Everyone say it. Jesus, thank you. You know, when you're kids, the answer is always Jesus, right, in Sunday school? Okay, that's, that's this. Who's at the right hand of God now? Well, the answer is Jesus. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. And again, I, I'm going to read this, but you, you have it there for your reference. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Christ, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God exalted him to the highest place. Where is that? It's the right hand of God. Jesus himself said, Next time you see me, I will be sitting in my Father's glory at the right hand of the Father. And it's interesting, too, because it's in his hand. No one can just take it unless he gives it, right? No one can overpower God. It's in the hand of blessing. But not just anybody can walk up and say, hey, let me see that. We're going to talk about that just a little bit more. <clears throat> he alone has the authority to hand it to somebody. And it's not just laying on the shelf that anybody can go and pick up. Like in my office, i got a shelves full of books. Anybody can walk in there and take one of those books. You ever tried to grab something out of the hand of a toddler that they weren't supposed to have? Right? I mean, there is a death grip. And you're like, how is this small child so strong? Okay? Think of that. That's how it is. It's in God's hand. He, he, no, you're not going to take it. He alone has the authority to give it. So what is it? Why is it sealed? We talked a little bit about this. It's the destiny for mankind. It's, it's, our, it's his plans for our future. It's what's going to happen in the days to come. <clears throat> and again, his plans are too vast. They're beyond our comprehension. And if we tried to understand all of it and the reasons why, we, we'd, never, we'd never see it. Anybody do Needlepoint? Anybody? My grandma used to do Needlepoint. You guys remember Needlepoint? Okay. You look at the top of it and it's beautiful, right? Everything is laid out in perfect order. Everything is planned. All the colors are... You ever look at the bottom of Needlepoint? 
oh my goodness, there's knots and strings and things hanging down, and it's a mess. There's snot over here and this over there. Okay, we are looking up at God's plans. <laughs> what we're seeing hanging down are the knots and the strings and what, what is going on up there? And God goes, hey, I got this. They're just changing color, you know. He's got a plan. It's all laid out. You and I, we just kind of see the ugly underside of it sometimes. and go, I don't get it. I don't know where it's going. But someday when we're on the top side looking down, we go, oh, I, I get it now. Right? It all makes sense. Right? That's kind of where we are. And again, Psalm 130. I think I put that. I must have copied that and put it in there wrong. Because <clears throat> I have got that in there twice, don't I? Oh, well. That's right. Remember that. When you see something once, pay attention. When you see it twice, really pay attention. When you see it three times, you know you're supposed to understand it. <clears throat> so the scroll had writing on both sides. Now, this was not by accident. God didn't just run out of space. <laughs> okay? Uh, this was typical of their time. Now, you've got to understand, papyrus, which is what the scrolls were made out of, was very expensive. The only people who made papyrus were the Egyptians. And you know, if you have something that only one person has, supply and demand. Ladies, do you know why you have diamond rings for your engagement rings? Because De Beers said you had to have diamond engagement rings. And you know why, men, you paid thousands of dollars for an engagement ring made of diamond? Because De Beers told you you were going to pay thousands of dollars for a diamond. Every time a new diamond company pops up, De Beers buys them out or shuts them down. Diamonds are not rare. They're a dime a dozen. But they're heavily regulated, right? The same was true of papyrus in their day. So it was very common for them to write on the front of the papyrus and then write on the back of the papyrus. That's just the way things went. If we look at uh, Exodus, <coughs> excuse me, Exodus chapter uh, 32, I want to read this to you. Moses turned and went down the mountain with two tablets of the covenant of law in his hands. Right? So these are the stone tablets. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets. Right? So Moses has the stone tablets, and we always see them. Right? He walks like this, he's carrying the stone tablets, and all ten are written on the front sides. That's just for the picture. It's kind of like at the Last Supper. They didn't all sit on the same side of the table for the picture, right? Everyone sit over here and smile. Okay? That was just an artistic portrayal. God wrote on both sides. That's just how God does it. That's, that's the way he does it. Why? Again, his plans are too vast for me. He didn't need a scroll at all. And yet, here we see a scroll with writing on both sides. And again, in Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 9 and 10... Ezekiel is having a vision of God, and he says, Then I looked, and I saw a hand stretched out to me, and it was a scroll, which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. Now, different scroll, different time, different purpose. But still, Ezekiel sees God, and he sees in his right hand a scroll with writing on both sides. For them, that was a sign of condemnation for Israel, because Israel was really, they were really missing the mark on a lot of things. Everything. And so God said to them through Ezekiel, hey, bad stuff's coming, and this is why. So we see, again, the continuity of Scripture. We see the same characteristics of God described past, present, future. He's always the same. He is unchanging. And I think, too, God is not wasteful. You know, I, I just think this, this is just my personal observation. I think God is not wasteful. Yes, in all his glory and all his splendor, he didn't need a scroll, but yet he uses the scroll. He uses both sides. Why? Because he's not wasteful. There's nothing done by accident. There's nothing wasted. God does not make waste. He makes things perfect. Yes, even with people. I know there are people out there that have done terrible, horrible, unspeakable things. And yet they are still made in the image of God. They're just deeply flawed and deeply broken by sin. And yet, at the same time, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. Just like that. God is not wasteful. He doesn't make extra people. <laughs> he makes just the right amount of people at just the right time, and he loves each and every one of them, and he knows them by name, and he knows how many beats they have left in their heart and how many hairs on it on their head. God is not wasteful, and I, I find that beautiful here. Okay, and it's sealed with seven seals. Now, this is not the kind of seal, okay? This is a clay stamp. 
<clears throat> this, to me, I love history. I love archaeology. This is actually the stamp of King Hezekiah. If, if you go back and read the Old Testament, you're going to read about King Hezekiah. He was a real-life person who really existed in Scripture. And some people say, well, the Old Testament is false. It's just a bunch of stories. No, this guy actually existed. There is his royal seal. They found that. That belonged to the man you're reading out in Scripture. He took his ring on that clay stamp and went a couple thousand years ago. And there it is. The Bible is true. It always has been true. It always will be true. Even secular archaeologists who do not believe the Bible to be the word of God, they will look to the Bible because if the Bible says this city existed in this place at this time, they can go to that place at that time and they'll find the city. It always proves itself to be true. That's one reason I love archaeology. It proves the Bible again and again and again and again to be historically accurate. So this is what we're talking about. Now, I don't know exactly what material the, the stamps are in heaven. I mean, the streets are made of gold, so who knows? But this is what John is seeing. The seal identifies the author. So you think about when Jesus was crucified, they took his body down, they put it in the tomb, they rolled the big stone over it and chained it, and then they marked the stone with the seal of Caesar. And basically what they were saying, if anyone breaks that seal, they're answerable to Caesar if they don't have the authority to break the seal. The same way in our context, if there's a crime scene, the police will put a seal on the door, right? Crime scene, do not enter. Unless you have the authority and the permission to cut the seal, if you do that, you're, it, it's, a, it's against the law, right? It's punishable. It's crime. In the same way, these seals, they can't be opened by anybody. Only someone who is authorized to open the seals can open the seal. Again, seven. Every time you see a number in Revelation, it has a deeper meaning. Okay? It's not just the number seven. Seven represents perfect. It's perfectly sealed. What we would call top secret, which, as we know on this side of eternity, it's not really all that secret anymore. Thank you, WikiLeaks. Thank you, Google. Thank you, right? Perfectly secret for us it just means it's harder to get to. But for God, it's perfect. You're not opening that seal unless you're the one that can open the seal. <clears throat> the perfect seal can only be opened by the perfect one. <clears throat> There's only one that can do that. And then he says, I saw a mighty angel. Now, he's not identified here. I don't want to get off on a tangent and say, oh, this was the archangel. Okay? The only two angels in the whole Bible that are named are Gabriel and Michael. That's it. The rest of them are just angels. Now, they're described with certain features and different characteristics, but everything else is, is kind of derived. Uh, everything we, we know about angels is derived from tradition. All that we know about angels is they exist. They have specific jobs. Some are described with wings, and this is what they do. Okay? This one is described as a mighty angel. What does that mean? I don't know. The word angel, right, in Greek, the way, the way John wrote this, this was originally written in a language called Koine Greek. It's a dead language now, but it was the universal language. It was like English of its day. Right now, if you have a Chinese pilot flying over mainland China, he's speaking in English to the controller on the ground, right? That's the universal language of the air. If I have a Russian pilot flying over Swaziland, he's speaking to the controllers in English. Okay? That's the same thing that was true of Greek in their day. If I was from Jerusalem, I could travel to England or Spain or Africa or Romania and speak Greek and everyone would understand. It was a universal language. So in the word of John, this is a mighty angel, the angloss, and it literally means messenger. So your post person, not your mail carrier, I can still say mailman, I'm not politically correct. Your mailman is an angel. They are a messenger. They are bringing a message from somebody to you. Now, they may not act like angels all the time, right? <laughs> you guys remember Funny Farm, the Chevy Chase film? The guy got really, that's, by the end of the run, he's pretty liquored up. Right? Just kind of throws the mail out the door like, you know, whatever. Okay, but an angel here, a mighty angel is a mighty messenger. And what does the angel do? He proclaims a message to heaven and earth and under the earth, all of creation. 
This is how mighty he is. He is mighty enough to make one announcement heard throughout all of creation. I don't know about you, but that's pretty mighty. Okay? Not even the internet can do that. Especially if you have cocks. <laughs> this is all of creation. Now it says heaven, earth, and under the earth. That is not the throne room. Okay? It's not saying there is no one that could open the scroll. It's saying there was no one in all of creation. The angel can enlist created things, but not the deity. Okay? He's facing from the throne room, he's facing out to everything else. He can talk to all of creation, looking for someone who is worthy. It doesn't apply to what's, what's in the throne room. Okay? So who is worthy? It's not based on strength. right? This guy is so mighty, he can make one announcement to the whole world. Surely he can open it. No. It's not based on who is the strongest or who is the best at this or that. This is, that's an earthly characteristic, an earthly measure. right? Might makes right. Have you heard that before? Survival of the fittest. To the victor goes the spoils. History is written by the victors. Okay? That's, that's something that we measure. But God's standard of measure is different from ours. He doesn't look at physical strength. Opening the scroll is more than just breaking a piece of clay or cutting a piece of string. There's more to it than that. It's revealing and initiating God's plan for humanity. Okay? This is what the scroll is. So it's not a matter of who's the strongest. It's a matter of who is authorized. So who is worthy? No one in all of creation. No one throughout human history. Remember, God is separate from time, right? He sees past, present, future all at once. He is, he's up here and time is down here. No one in all of human history, no one in all of creation is worthy to open the scroll. And John weeps. He says, I wept and I wept. And again, in their culture, this was not, this was loud. This was what we would say obnoxious. This is on the floor wailing. In fact, in some cultures, if you don't weep hard enough, they say you didn't love the person. Right? There are certain cultures, they will actually hire professional mourners to show how much they love the person. So you could get paid 50 bucks. I need you to come cry at my grandma's funeral. I'm done, right? And it's a show. Why? To show how much I miss the person and how much I love the person. When John says he weeps, this is loud. You think about in heaven, right? The angel makes this pronouncement. Who is worthy to open the scroll? And then John's over here weeping. I mean, loud, sobbing cries. Because there is no one who is worthy in all of creation. And I don't think he's just disappointed, right? Man, I really thought there would be someone in creation. I, I don't think this is a, he's disappointed. I think he understands that only God has the answers that are needed to the peril that is facing the church, right? The church in 90, 95 AD is going through some rough stuff. I mean, they're actively being hunted and killed. And there is no one on earth that can open the scroll. And yet, we want to look everywhere else first. And John's saying if we would just look to God first, we could avoid all this. I think he knows the answer. John's an intelligent guy. You know, most people when they hit 90, 95, they're pretty wise. Even if they're not intellectually smart on paper, they're very wise people. Why? Because of what they've seen and what they've endured. They've learned a lot of things. John is very wise, and he understands the answer is not in creation. The answer is the creator. Why can't we just start at the source? If we could just start there, we'd be a lot better off. Sometimes I think we view prayer as a last resort. Well, I've tried everything else. Maybe I should pray. And, and I get that. I, I am of the philosophy. One of my favorite quotes, you've heard me say this, God doesn't expect us to pray for a hole while we're leaning on a shovel. And sometimes God has already given us the tools that we need to do the work, right? Kind of like the story of the old man on the porch and the floodwaters are coming and the truck rolls up and says, no, no, God's going to save me. And he's on the porch roof and the boat comes up. No, no, God's going to save me. Then he's on top of the house and the helicopter comes. No, no, God's going to save me. And he drowns. He says, God, why did you not? I sent you a truck, a boat, and a helicopter. What else do you want, guy? <laughs> right? Sometimes we need to take advantage of what we have, what God has already provided. 
And we as Americans, that's kind of our personality. Work first, pray later. Let's just keep moving forward. Even if it's the wrong direction, we're still moving, by golly. I ain't stopping for directions. But if we would just stop and ask God, Lord, what do I do before we move? And we'd be so much better off. And I think that's why John is weeping. He's, he's broken for the church because he sees the big problem. Man, the church is persecuted. If we would just turn to God and not look for ways to appease Caesar or this or that. right? He just wrote these letters to the churches. Talk about how five out of seven are failing. One of them's, yeah, you're there. And one of them, only one of them's really doing great. His heart is already broken for the church. And now he's weeping. And so one of the elders comes over. He says, do not weep. Do not weep. Now, isn't this interesting? This is a question that popped in my mind. Why not an angel? Right? The angels are the messengers of God. This is what they do. They're, they're messengers. But one of the 24 elders around the room stops what they're doing. And they come over to John. Right? See him. Put, put their arm around John. Buddy, brother, brother, come here. Don't cry. Don't weep. It's going to be okay. Why not an angel? Because angels don't know the heartbreak of sin or the joys of salvation. They, they have one job. That, I mean, to be an angel, we, we talk about our loved ones becoming angels. Our loved ones are so much better than angels. Because angels, they do one thing, whatever they're told. They have no free will. They have no experience with sin or, or death or hell or loss. I mean, they, I mean, I'm sure they understand it because they've seen it. But for them, it's just a job, right? I was watching a video the other day. These people were tearing down an old house. And as they tore down one wall to this bedroom, the guy looked up, and there was an American flag folded in a triangle sitting on a shelf that someone had forgotten. So he got up on the bucket of this front loader and got up there, and he got it off the wall. Why? Because it means something to somebody. It's special. It's not just a piece of cloth. It has weight. It has importance. They may see this, but to them it's just the way it is. The elders, right? They, they're people. They're humans. They understand why John's heart is broken. I mean, the angels are going, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> He's in heaven. He should be happy. Look, we're showing him things. Man, I, got, I got this. I got this. John, buddy, come here. The gospel message of the good news must come from mankind. Right? It must come from us. We are the bearers of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what the elder tells him. He says, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. That's good news. He said, see, he is able, he is worthy to open the scrolls and his seven seals. The elder shares the gospel message with John. He shares with him, there's good news, John. There's hope. It's not a hopeless cycle. It's not just bad to worse, to worse, to worse, without ever ending. There is hope. There is a promise here. There is a future. There is one who is worthy. Hey, Amen. I got goosebumps. Hallelujah. There is one who is worthy. Not in creation, but the one who created. Remember, the angel, he spoke out here. God's on the throne. He always has been. He always will be. The answer is not out there. He says, there is one who is worthy. John, you know him. You know him, John. You've already met him up here. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. I love this title. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49, verses 8 through 12. Blessings are being handed out to the sons of Israel. And he says, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Now, again, that's 
not just a father giving some nice words to his son. This is a father passing on a divine blessing to his son Judah. These words that is being spoken are not just, hey, son, I wish you well. I hope you're going to be good. These carried a spiritual weight to them. And so he says to Judah, you are a lion, and the staff, the scepter, will not depart from you until the one who is really coming to reign has come to take it. These are important words. So he talks about the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's talking about he who is, belongs to. He says, you will have the right to rule until he comes to whom it belongs, this royal scepter. That's a messianic title. The people of the first century church, they understood this. The Jews, they understood the lion of the tribe of Judah was a messianic title. It meant whoever bore that title was the one they were looking for. It's kind of a, of a clue, right? If this guy comes and people were calling him the lion of the tribe of Judah, we need to pay attention. Now, this begs the question, why is it Judah still in power? Even today, Israel is in a state of unrest and upheaval. And we could argue that the modern state of Israel is, is not really the promised tribes that existed when this blessings were handed down. Why? They, they made some poor choices, and they reaped the benefits of those poor choices. If we look at Ezekiel chapter 21, again, verses 25 and 27, I'm going to read that to you. This is God speaking. He said, You profane and wicked prince of Israel, whose day has come, whose time of punishment has reached its climax, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Take off the turban, remove the crown. It will not be as it was. The lowly will be exalted, and the exalted will be brought low. A ruin, a ruin, I will make it a ruin. The crown will not be restored until he to whom it rightfully belongs shall come. To him I will give it. Now this is God using these words of blessing now as a curse. Hey, you guys had it. I gave you everything you needed to succeed. And you've blown it, and you've blown it, and you've blown it, and I can't let you blow it again. The time of punishment has come. So now that scepter that you guys were supposed to hang on to, you've lost it, and I'm going to hold on to it for you until the one that comes is worthy of it. Israel had once again turned their backs on God, and so God removed the scepter. Babylon was his sword of judgment. They went into captivity. They lost their identity. They lost themselves. They lost their, their land. And for 70 years, they were in captivity. Again, 70, right? Number seven is a perfect captivity. Well, that's kind of hard to say, right? But it worked. It proved a point. And when they returned, they were praising God and blessing him. But God removed their right to rule. And so now when it talks about the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's saying here is the one, as he said, until he comes to whom it belongs, the lion of the tribe of that title belongs now to the one who came. And who is that? His name is Jesus. And he fulfilled the prophecy that God had spoken. And then he also says the root of David. Now, this one I did put on here for you. This is two verses. You really, you need to read all of Isaiah 11. I, I have it printed out, but I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's too long for tonight. But Isaiah 11, you and I with our New Testament glasses on, go back and read it and you just see Jesus, 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 right? It's got his fingerprints all over it. It's beautiful. It's amazing. But verse 1 and verse 10, I'll give you these two verses. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Okay, that's verse 1 and verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. Now, we read that, and we can see Jesus. Okay, It looks forward to the ideal king that would come from the line of David. This is that promise, that prophecy that God gave through Isaiah. Hey, I know we're in exile right now. That's where Isaiah was preaching. He was preaching in exile. I know we're in exile right now, but God still has a plan. And there will come a perfect king, a perfect ruler from David's line. God's going to keep that promise. Even though we're in exile now, God is not. And those promises are still true. They saw it again as a messianic title, the Messiah. That literally means promised one. Okay? Messiah in Hebrew or Messiah, Christ, Christos in Greek. 
means the promised one. It's like hello and hola. Both mean hi. Okay? Same thing with Saya and Christos. Messiah and Christ. This is a title. They're looking ahead for the promised one. And again, if, if you read Romans 12, 15, uh, which, don't tell me, I didn't put that one on here. Never in all my born days. What's that? You rejoice with those who rejoice. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And weep with those who weep. Pull that up here so I can read it. So those who are watching online. What did I say? 12, 15. Mm -hmm. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Right? He's coming to do those things. He's not going to bend, the, or he's not going to break a already bent reed, right? He's coming to restore things. He's coming to be with the people. We see the lion and the shepherd united in Christ, right? The lion and the lamb are united as one. So let's talk about this lion and the lamb a little bit. It says he triumphed, right? He has triumphed. Now, Colossians, I do have this one, 2.13c. Again, we're talking about half the verse here. 2.15. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Amen. Hallelujah. He has triumphed. Through the cross. That's how he did these things. When Jesus died on the cross, his last word was to telestai. It's in Greek. Again, it's perfect. It means it is finished. There was one word. That's what it means. It is finished. To telestai. And it is written in the perfect tense. Now, we have past, present, future. I am running. I ran. I will run. Right? That's not the right order for those things. But... You know what I'm saying? We have three tenses, past, present, future. Greek has seven. It's a very exact language, which is one reason I believe why Jesus came when he did. There's not a whole lot of ambiguity in Greek. The, the, the gray areas of our faith usually come from the English being vague, not the Greek. God spelled it out perfectly. When Jesus said this, it is in the perfect tense, which means it was true, it is true, it always will be true. Does that sound familiar? What was and is and is to come? It's perfect. When Jesus says, it is finished, that sacrifice once and for all covered all those sacrifices that were made in the past and hope that someday the perfect sacrifice would come. And it covers all of us moving forward. It is finished. It is perfectly finished. Finished. To Telestai. His last word, he shouted it from the cross. It is finished. It was perfect. We read 1 Corinthians 54 through 57. Again, another one. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortar, mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I love this. He is our example in times of trial and persecution. Right? He didn't just wait for it to come back. He, he did something. He, he was that perfect power that broke the chains of death and sin and hell. And we can overcome through his name. Where's this thing of death? I don't have to worry about death anymore. Right. Why? Because God fixed it for me through Jesus Christ. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen. I don't have to worry about whether I'll live, live or die. Why? Because no matter what happens, God's in control. And I know Jesus Christ paid the price. So even if I do die, I'm going to be in heaven with God forever. I don't have to worry about it. This is beautiful. We can conquer through his name. This is why it says he has triumphed. It's beautiful words here. And I love this. He is able. 
He is able. Folks, he is able tonight. I'm going to tell you this. You get nothing else tonight from this. Know this. He is able. Whatever it is, he is able. Can he cure cancer? He is able. Can he bring back the dead? He is able. Can he save the nastiest, most vilest person from sin? He is able. It's beautiful. He is able. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, the Great Commission. Jesus begins the Great Commission by saying this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In other words, pay attention. Because the person who is speaking has the authority to give you this command. Why is he able? Because he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. It belongs to him. He alone is worthy. He alone has the authority. He alone sits at God's right hand. It's beautiful. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Any questions on the first five verses? This one's not as heavy on the symbolism as chapter four was. <laughs> chapter four was pretty heavy. It's going to get a little heavier as we move on into the next week, but, uh, and I'm sorry, the next section. All right, so let's move forward. I'm going to begin here at verse six, and I'm going to read through verse, uh, verse seven. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So we're going to stop for tonight. All right, I'm doing pretty good. I've, I've covered five verses in 45 minutes. Oh, this is deep stuff. I, I have to remind myself, pull up, because we're, we're diving too deep. We've got to pull up sometimes. We, we could spend days talking about a single word. You know, it's, it's beautiful. That's how... That's why 2,000 years later, we're still talking about the book of Revelation. He sees a lamb. Now, we just talked about the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, right? The root of David, this mighty king. And John looks and he sees a lamb. And not just any lamb, a rather weird looking lamb. Something strange about it. It's not a beautiful lamb. When we see lamb, we think gentle. We think sacrificial. If y'all remember my sermon on Sunday, we talk about the only reason why sheep are still alive is because they have good shepherds. They're stupid. They're, they're defenseless. The only thing a sheep can do is nip at you, and even then it's just like, ow, why'd you do that, right? It's like a bee sting. You can sting me once, sure. But he won't do that again, right? John and all the world was not looking for the gentle, sacrificial lamb. They were looking for the mighty warrior king. John 1, 29. This is John the Baptist. The next day, John, which would be John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John proclaimed that. He just looked at him and saw him. And what happened to the lion? <laughs> right? We just talked about this. What happened to the lion? Here, John uses the word arnion. Now, this is, this is beautiful. The only time this word is used, it's used, what does it say here in my Bible? It says uh, 29 times in Revelation. It talks about the lamb. It's really what the word means. Arnion is Greek. It means lamb. And it also means lamb in John chapter 21, verse 15, where Jesus is sitting with Peter, he's restoring him. He says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. This hit me a little hard today. I got, I got a little misty. I'd sit in my office reading this. What happened to the lion? Well, go back to Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read this to you again. Read you the first part. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. What's that look like? Being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
That's why God exalted him to the highest place. He gave him the name that is above every name. What happened to the lion? He became one of us. You see that? He became one of the sheep. He gave up his kingliness and his godliness. He gave that godly prerogative and he became a human being to walk in our shoes, to hurt, to feel the loss, the, the, the brokenness, to understand the temptation. When he was in the desert, he was tempted in every way imaginable. We get three, we get a little pinhole view of, of this temptation, but he was tempted in every way imaginable for 40 days. He knows the burdens of our heart. He knows what it's like to lose a father. He knows what it's like to see loved ones turn away and deny you and, and the family abandon you. He knows what it's like to move from place to place and, and not be able to settle down. He knows what it's like to hit your thumb with a hammer and go, oh, right? He, he's gotten splinters. He's gotten sick. He's gotten... The shepherd became one of the sheep. And because of that, he's the best shepherd ever because he knows the sheep unlike anyone else ever could. <clears throat> And now we see the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. One looking as if he had been slain. And this was one odd looking lamb. It wasn't a perfect little lamb hopping around happy. It was one that looked like it had been slain. And for them this was a very specific ritual of killing a lamb for a sacrifice. It was unmistakable. When John looks like, looks at, he's seeing a sacrificial lamb. That's what he's saying. He's not just saying it looked like I got hit by a truck. He's saying this lamb was a sacrificial lamb. It had been sacrificed. Remember John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb to the slaughter. And as it is a sheep before its shear is a silent, so he did not open his mouth. He became the lamb of God for us. He became the sacrifice for our sins. And because of that, he's been exalted to the highest place, the name above all names, and he's at the center of the throne, right? Remember I said about the, the four beasts, location, location, location. They're in the center of everything because they're important, and they have an important role to play. When John sees Jesus, it says he's at the center of the throne. He's at the core of everything. And that should be so true of our lives. Our lives should be a reflection of heaven. Our church should be a reflection of the temple in heaven, right? God is at the center and Jesus Christ is the core of everything for us. He should be the core of our very existence. And so he alone has earned the right to sit at the right hand of the Father. Why? Because he became the sacrifice for our sins. That made him worthy to open the scroll. The, the story did not end in the grave. It did not end on the cross because he rose again. And then he describes it as seven horns and seven eyes. Again, this is one weird looking lamb. Okay, bear with me. This does not mean it had like seven physical horns and seven, okay, this is symbolic. In their culture, the horn was a symbol of power, a symbol of strength, a symbol of authority. Go back and read Daniel. He talks about this beast that came out and it had ten horns. Right? There was a lot of power in this beast. More than it should have had, right? Because seven is perfect. He's got perfect strength. The lamb here has perfect strength. The beast in Daniel was too power. It did too, it had too much power, right? It was power hungry. It was trying to get more than what it needed. And it had one little horn that was very loud and boisterous and it kept blaspheming God. And that's when the thrones were set in place. And the horn was destroyed. Okay, here we see this horn still, thousands of years later, it still represents strength. Much like when we see a bald eagle flying through the sky, right? like, wow, majestic. Right? That's America, right? It's, it's our symbol. 200 years later, we're still love the eagle, right? Because it's still, it's what it represents for us. I mean, it's just a bird at the end of the day, but it's what it represents. When John looks at the lamb and he sees seven horns, he sees perfect power. Not too much. It's not abusive of power. It's not too little. It's not weak. It's not anemic. <coughs> Excuse me. It's seven. It's the perfect amount of power. Perfect strength. And it has seven eyes. 
He is perfectly aware of everything all the time. Nothing escapes his view. Think of the four beasts, right? They were covered with eyes, front and back, top, bottom. They're covered in eyes. They guard the throne. They see everything. Nothing is hidden from their sight, right? God is omniscient. He knows everything, right? That's what Jesus, or what John is saying about the lamb here. He's got seven eyes. He sees everything. Nothing is hidden from Jesus in your life. Nothing. He knows it all. There are no skeletons in your closet that he doesn't know about. He gets it. He sees it. He is all-knowing, and he is all-powerful. That's what the seven eyes and the seven horns mean. This lamb is all-knowing, he is all-powerful. He's omniscient, and he's omnipotent. And then he goes on and says, These seven eyes and the seven horns are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the world. There's a lot of sevens going on here. Do you see the perfect, 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 perfect? <laughs> Do you guys get the perfect yet? As John made his point, it's perfect. It's perfect. Do you want to know what John thinks about God? He thinks he's perfect. You ever, you ever meet someone that just went on a date and had a really great time? That's all they talk about is the date and how great it was. And by the end of the time, you're like, I wish I'd gone on the date so I could tell you how perfect it was too, right? <laughs> I got it. You've made your point. I, I have some friends. They want to tell you about someone. And they'll say, you know so-and-so? Like, yeah, I know. They're the ones that have the, the, you know, the, the, the blue hair. Yeah, I, I know. And they got all the piercings. Yeah, yeah, I know, the, I know who you're talking about. And they drive the arm. Yes, I know who you're talking about, okay? John's really trying to make it clear here. There's perfection going on. God is perfect. Jesus is perfect. His power is perfect. And now we have the seven spirits of God. Seven. It's the perfect spirit of God. It, some translations, you might say the sevenfold spirit, right? It means perfection. It's the perfect spirit of God. We've already talked about that. And, and I love this too. This is beautiful. This is a very Trinitarian view of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three, they coexist. They're co-eternal in majesty, co-eternal in glory. But the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. And yet they are one Godhead. How does that work? I don't know. I'll tell you when I get there. Okay? I, this is one of the things that's beyond my limited understanding. But we see God the Father on the throne... We see God the Son is at the center of the throne. And coming from his mind and his, his, his vision, right, the seven eyes and the seven horns, his all-knowingness comes from the Spirit of God, which proceeds to the whole earth from the throne. And it's interesting, as John is looking at the throne, he's seeing God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. They're all right there in the center of the throne together. If God is seated on the throne, and Jesus is at the core of the throne, and the Spirit is... All over Jesus, and he's coming out from the throne, that, that means they're all God. The divinity of Jesus was settled a long time before human ever got behind it. John understood it, he saw it. And yet we're a little slow, right? We're sheep. <laughs> we're not all that bright sometimes. But what John sees is he sees God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I love what John said in John chapter 16. And I know we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to hurry. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness. It's about the Holy Spirit. And about sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. We see that here, right? Where, where is the Spirit? He's the seven eyes and the seven horns. Where are they? On the head of the Lamb. Where is the Lamb? At the core of the throne. And so whatever the Spirit hears from the throne, that's what he says to us. That's his function in all of this. The Father, the Son, the Spirit proceeds from them both. This is, this is how that works. They get, we're getting a glimpse of the inner mechanical workings. It's, I, I love, I got this one pocket watch that Sarah bought me, and I love it. When you wind it up, it's a skeletonized pocket watch. You can see all the bits and pieces and the parts moving behind the scenes, right? You see the little gears and the cogs and the little things spinning around in there. 
I love it. I can sit there and watch that little watch for hours. I just sit and watch all the little pieces move. That's kind of what we're seeing. We're just seeing the bits and pieces move. We're kind of seeing behind the scenes a little bit of how God works. And again, so there in John, he gives us the work of the Spirit. All right, last slide. Doing pretty good. The Lamb who was worthy. This is verse 7. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. The Lamb took the scroll. Not the mighty angel, not the elders, not the four living creatures, not John, the Lamb, the one who had been slain, took the throne, or took the scroll from the throne. He alone is worthy to open it. And here's the thing, it must be opened. Because God has decreed it must be opened. And God's plans will always be completed. Amen. Always be completed. I put a note in here. This came from uh, the Wesleyan Bible Commentary, which is one of the commentaries I, I reference quite a bit. Um, it says this, Symbols are both descriptions of experienced realities and statements of belief about their meaning. They are suggestive, not dogmatic, Indeed, they contain within themselves an acknowledgement that they do not presume to make a full description. So as we're looking at what John has, has written down, right? what this is saying is symbols are descriptions of experienced realities. John is trying to write what he experienced. The only way he can communicate that is with symbols. This is kind of what this is like. Life is like a box of chocolates. Right? Why? Because you never know what you're going to get. If you ask someone to phrase up life in, in a sentence, it doesn't get any better than that, right? You never know what's coming down the pipe. Okay? John is using symbols because he's trying to explain this reality. And he wants to tell you what he believes about his meaning to be true. This is suggestive. It's not dogmatic. It's not, this is exactly what this is. It's, it's suggestive. John is trying to say it's kind of like this. I mean, it's not really like this, but this is as close as I can think to get it to come across. And I love how it says this. They contain within themselves the acknowledgement that they do not presume to make a full description. John would not say, this is exactly what I saw. John is saying, this is the closest I could come on paper. This is as good as I could get it, but it was so much more than what I can tell you about here. You're just going to have to see it for yourself. I found that a helpful way to look at some of the symbols, right? The letters, the numbers, the, this kind of thing. They're not perfect in that that's exactly the way it was. It wasn't a green, you know, all green emerald rainbow around the throne, right? We talked about it looked like fire. Well, the carnelian and this, they looked like fire around the throne. John's looking at this aura and trying to figure out what's going on in here. He sees this lamb. It looks like it's been slain, but it's still, it's, it's still a per, you know, is it? So again... Take these things, I would say, with, with a grain of salt. John, I think, is the best person in the world to write down what he saw. And I think that's the reason why John stayed alive the longest. God kept him alive and put him on the island of Patmos so he could be alone with God and have this vision. Because out of all the apostles, he was the only one who was uniquely equipped to write down these things as good as he did. But even then, they don't even begin to scratch the surface of the glory and the majesty and the beauty of God Almighty and seeing the Lamb that has been slain take the scroll. And as we move forward into the worship service next week and, and maybe into chapter 6 in two weeks, just remember, we are just scratching the surface. We got, we got the pinhole right through the gate. And that, that's what we're seeing. There's so much more going on. So... I got us through chapter or verse 7. We'll pick up at verse 8 next week. Go back and read chapter 5 again. Uh, if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Call me, something. I, I'm always available. I don't know that I have the answers, but I can look for them. And I know the one who does, all right? Let me pray with you, then we'll get out of here. Father God, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the time we've had to study your word. I ask, Lord, that as we leave from here, we will think on these things. We will hide them in our hearts, Lord, and we will continue to let them marinate throughout the rest of the week. We'll not just take them and set them aside and go, well, that was neat. But Lord, we will constantly think about these things. And Father God, I pray that we will have opportunities to share our faith this week with someone else. We don't have to have all the words. We don't have to have all the answers, Lord, because you do. And I ask that you will flow to us and through us by the Spirit, Lord, 
who lives within us. And Father, you will give us the words at the opportunity and time. We love you, Father God, and I pray your blessings upon us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all. God bless. You are dismissed.